Uh, good morning and, and welcome to the fourth meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I remind colleagues to do the usual with your mobile phones, at least put them in a, an order that we, they don't interfere with proceedings. Uh, the only business on our agenda today is to take evidence on the EU withdrawal bill as amended in the House of Commons. We will hear from the Minister for UK Negotiations in Scotland's place later in the morning. But before that, we're joined by Professor Ailey McCarg, who is the Professor of Public Law at the University of Strathclyde, and Professor Alan Page, Professor of Public Law at the University of Dundee. I welcome both of the witnesses to the committee. I know you've been before us before, so I'm very grateful for your attendance again today. You've provided us with written briefings, which have been circulated to members, and I think, therefore, we'll just go straight to questions. And Emma, do you just want to set the scene with your question, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, in our briefing note, we have information that talks about uh, certain amendments that have been made to the EU withdrawal bill and what would be the impact that that would have on the devolution settlement. In our note, it says that, um, um, that the provisions make clear that the devolved governments will be able to use secondary legislation to deal with deficiencies in retained EU law and that that needs to be done before exit day as long as they have consulted rather than obtained the consent of the UK government. So could you, I guess, extrapolate on that a little bit for me, please? I think that's a relatively minor amendment. The, uh, the bill, as originally introduced, provided that uh, where those powers were to be used to make certain changes, uh, uh, changes which were to come into effect before exit day, changes to reciprocal agreements, then the consent of UK ministers would be required to the making of those changes. Uh, but the bill as amended simply provides that uh, the requirement is one of consultation rather than consent. Uh, but I, overall, I don't think it's a particularly uh, significant uh, change. Okay. I'm just curious about the impact of, is there anything that's going to be significant or not with, uh, as we move forward with our, you know, the pro progress of the, the withdrawal bill? Just in that yeah, narrow, yeah. Not just in that narrow amendment. Sorry, could you well, repeat the question? I mean, I I am not a lawyer, and as someone who's trying to speak to constituents about what's happening as we progress this withdrawal bill, and there's amendments that have been made, that uh, it's very technical, and I'm sure there's people in the room that will be able to help answer Ooh. the information. But how is Scotland? Parliament going to be affected either positively or negatively as we move forward <coughs> with the settlement um, of this withdrawal bill? By the, the amendments that have been made? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, well, as Alan says, I think n not very much. Um, there are some, some changes to um, Clause 7, which is the power to correct the statute book. Um, Clause 7 gives regulation-making powers to ministers and then Schedule 2 um, kind of replicates these with some, some uh, modifications for the Scottish ministers. So, so there's, there's a slight narrowing of, of the Clause 7 regulation-making powers, which then has a knock-on effect on um, the Scottish government's regulation-making powers, but it is a very slight narrowing. Um, as Alan says, the, um, the issue regarding consent to certain types of Scottish government regulations has been downgraded to a right requirement of consultation. Um, there has been a clarification that um, where uh, retained direct EU law, which means things like uh, directly effective regulations, um, where these are removed from the scope of the Clause 11, restriction and devolved to Scotland, um, then the Scottish ministers will have the power to correct the statute book in relation to those, which it didn't in the original draft of the bill. But again, these are quite narrow, um, narrow um, amendments which don't really make very much difference in principle. There are some more significant amendments to UK ministers' regulation-making powers in terms of the procedures that apply in the House of Commons, there's a new sifting procedure that's been introduced and new requirements of um, explanatory memorandums. But interestingly, that those are not applied to the Scottish government's regulation-making powers. Um, I presume the reason for that is because 
Um, the House of Commons didn't think it appropriate to tell this Parliament how you should exercise your scrutiny functions. Nevertheless, it's, it's hard to see the argument in principle why this Parliament should have um, lesser control over the procedures followed by the Scottish ministers than, than the House of Commons will have over um, regulations made by UK ministers. So that's something I think this Parliament needs to, uh, to think about, to think about how, uh, what kind of procedural control over the Scottish Government's regulations would be appropriate and how you're going to get that into the bill. Okay. That's quite interesting. Could you tell us a bit more about what you think this Parliament should do in these circumstances? Either your, yourself or Alan. Um, I think I sent that out in a paper to the committee the, the last time I gave evidence that I'm trying, <laughs> trying to recall what I said in that paper. But uh, uh, I, think, I think the starting point is that the, the powers to make subordinate legislation, whether to correct deficiencies or um, ensure that the UK um, can continue to comply with its international obligations. These powers are, there are corresponding powers for the Scottish ministers, uh, subject to some of the restrictions which uh, Professor McHarg has mentioned. Um, the likelihood is uh, that in some cases at least, these things will be done on a UK-wide basis. Um, and the fact that they are done on a UK-wide basis doesn't mean that they're not of interest to this Parliament. And the question, therefore, and this was the question which I highlighted before, the question becomes one, then, of the oversight which this Parliament has over the exercise of those powers uh, on, a, on a GB or a UK-wide basis. And I'm assuming um, that, and I'm broadening it slightly now, uh, but I'm assuming that at some point uh, the bill will be amended uh, so as to make the exercise of UK ministers' powers in relation to Scotland, uh, uh, in relation to de devolved matters, subject to the consent of the Scottish ministers generally, which has not happened so far. This amendment that we were talking about earlier is, is much narrower than that. Uh, and the crucial thing uh, in those circumstances, uh, as I said before, is that this Parliament knows when that is being done, uh, that it can, uh, that it's informed that it's being done, it can scrutinise um, the decision to go on a UK-wide rather than a Scotland-only basis. It's informed about that. Um, and question yet to be answered or still to be thought about, what uh, contribution of any uh, can it make to the exercise of those powers at Westminster rather than in this Parliament? And, and, and the last bit then is, assuming it's done here, you know, what procedures will this Parliament uh, subject the exercise of those powers to? Okay. Well, I think you're specific on Schedule 2 in regard to this. I it's, thanks, Bruce. I suppose it's difficult to get excited about Schedule 2, but uh, I wonder if you could help us clarify. I mean, I mean you, say, you mentioned Professor McHarg downgrading from consent to consultation. I mean, that, that does sound like something of some significance where the first implies a right of veto effectively, but the second implies a consultative process. But in that consultative process, is it defined where the decision making will lie in there? Let me um, find it. There's, yes, it's is it effectively is consent it? by other means, or is it genuine consultation? Um, Do we know? We probably it, don't know. <laughs> yes, it, no, it doesn't say anything other than, um, than, than regulations can't be made unless, uh, unless there's been consultation with the Secretary of State. So it doesn't, it doesn't say anything about the, pr that. the process. I mean, I think you're, you're right that, that obviously a shift from consent to consultation is uh, an important change in principle. Um, I think the rationale for the consent requirement was that, well, the UK government said they were concerned, um, particularly in relation to uh, regulations made before exit day, when we're still bound to comply with EU law, um, that the Scottish ministers might do something which put in jeopardy our compliance with EU law, and therefore they want a check over that. But, um, but they're, they're now satisfied that 
they, the consultation will be sufficient to, to, to avoid that kind of problem rather than consent. Okay, and then the other area, I think, uh, Professor Page, in your paper, it says ministers, Scottish ministers will be, able to, will be able to modify direct retained EU laws in areas where it's decided that a common framework is not necessary. Could you just tell us a bit more about that and what that means? Yes, this, this was one of the criticisms that was made of the bill as introduced, that they would not be able to uh, modify um, um, direct retained EU law. If, if it was to be modified, it could only be modified by... Uh, UK ministers, uh, and the, b the bill as amended now provides that in those areas uh, where the Clause 11 restriction uh, on the devolved institutions, that is to say the restriction whereby they cannot modify um, retained EU law, in those areas where that restriction uh, is lifted, and this is of course is the crucial issue, which will those areas be, and, and when, if at all, will that decision be made? Um, and the legislation amended. When that happens, assuming it happens, then in those areas, Scottish ministers will be able to modify direct, so e retained EU law. So you could almost say it's a, a consequential amendment. It anticipates that Clause 11 will be amended, but without Clause 11 yet having been amended. Well, it, I think it anticipates that the order making power under Clause yeah, 11 yeah, will yeah, be yeah. used, but as we know, as Clause 11 is currently drafted, there is no obligation to use uh, that order-making power and no time scale for the use of that order-making power. And th these, these um, regulation-making powers that we're talking about are subject to sunset clause anyway. They only apply for up to, before exit day and for up to two years after exit day. So um, again, that limits the significance of any change that's made to them. And in terms of those frameworks themselves, is there any removed anywhere further forward and who decides whether a common framework is necessary or not? Not, not, any further not on the progress? face of the bill. <laughs> I mean, that, that is the, um, the promise that was made was to bring um, an amendment to Clause 11 the, to the House of Commons at report stage and that, that obviously didn't happen. Um, there is now a commitment to bring it forward uh, during the Lord's stages, but um, at the moment um, you know as much as I think we do, about when that will happen and what that, that new version of Clause 11 will look like. Okay. Right. Thanks, I'm sorry, this is, this is getting quite deep in terms of the technical stuff, but, so I'm going to make it worse, I'm sorry. Um, if Clause 11 is removed satisfactorily or amended satisfactorily, why do we still need an order and council process to allow the Scottish Government to make modifications? to deficiencies? Well, it's a, it's a good question. It depends on um, the amendments to Clause 11 and what changes would need to be made <coughs> consequential upon those amendments. But, you know. Okay, that's it. I suppose that's the key. If yeah. you're going to, they'll, they'll also need then yeah. to amend this particular yeah. bit of Schedule 2 mm. to reflect whatever changes are in. Yeah, so I, I guess going back to what I said <coughs> earlier, um, it's not so much a consequential amendment as just um, saying that you know if the if uh, if the order making power under clause 11 is exercised, the restriction on the Scottish ministers, Scottish Parliament is lifted, then the Scottish ministers will be able to modify and direct okay. retain the EU law in those areas. If they get a that, lot of ifs. <laughs> if they get that, <laughs> I don't did. Thank you. That's, uh, uh, that's helped clarify it. So effect effectively, if Clause 11 goes, that doesn't really mean anything effective. No, no, you, you, so it would have a, no yeah. effect. It could stay in the statute, but it wouldn't mean anything. Well, yes. Okay, um, Neil. I mean, uh, um, Professor McHarg, in your submission, you said if the UK Parliament votes not to approve uh, the final withdrawal terms, you said that Parliament's choice may be to take it or leave it. I just wanted to explore a bit more about... What would be the consequences, you think, if the UK Parliament do does reject um, the terms of, of withdrawal? And um, you said it was unlikely that there'd be scope to renegotiate. Um, to what extent is that is that the case? And, and um, just explore the kind of consequences of that kind of take it or leave it uh, choice. Okay. Well, this depends on a whole range of of, of unknowns. Um, the Article 50 process 
um, the way it works on the face of the, the, the treaty is that once we've triggered Article 50, we have two years to negotiate, and at the end of two years, we leave the EU. Now, if we, we can either leave on terms that we've agreed, or we can leave on no agreed terms. That, that's what Article 50 says. So, on the face of it, if the UK Parliament chooses not to accept the terms of negotiation, the terms of withdrawal as negotiated by the UK government, then the alternative is that we just leave. We just leave with no, with no agreement. Now, the, 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 the unknowns in that, I suppose, are first of all, um, Article 50 does permit um, the two-year period to be extended by agreement. So that, that could happen, although you, you ask yourself what's the incentive on the EU27 to, to extend it. If, we, if they have uh, negotiated a set of terms and we don't like it, what is their, what's their incentive to reopen the negotiation period? Um, the alternative uh, unknown is around about whether we could, before our two years is up, could we um, uh, revoke our Article 50 negotiate, uh, notification? That is not clear on the text of Article 50. There are different views on the matter. Um, you're probably aware there is a, a case for the Court of Session, uh, an attempt to uh, get a reference of that question to the, uh, the European Court of Justice, but whether that will succeed remains to be seen. And what the answer is, of course, remains to be seen. So, um, so there, are, there are a range of unknowns here. We, 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 we don't know what would happen if, um, if Parliament were to reject the terms of the withdrawal agreement, but at least one possibility is, well, we just leave um, on the 29th of March, 2019. And, and if, if there was no, if the Parliament rejected a, a deal and there was no, and there was no renegotiation, um, and, and we just left, what would be the immediate consequences of that? Well, we would leave on uh, WTO terms, so it, it would affect our future trading relationship. I mean, it would affect potentially um, the rights of EU nationals and all of that kind of stuff that's been bound up in the in the negotiations. So. Patrick. Uh, thanks very much. Good morning. Just to, just to follow up on the, that uh, point that Neil Bebby was, uh, was asking about, the amendment that's been made to Clause 9 um, says that the regulation-making powers in, in relation to implementing the withdrawal agreement are subject to the prior enactment of a statute of Parliament uh, approving the final terms of withdrawal. Presumably that means a bill. That means a, a withdrawal agreement bill. Is it yet clear whether that bill requires legislative consent, or do we need to know what's in the withdrawal agreement to work that out? Well, I mean, I, I think that depends on what it depends on what the bill does. I mean, if if all the bill does is to um, grant an approval to the exercise of a power in international law, a, a treaty. Well, this Parliament has no treaty making powers, and therefore, I think you would make the argument that it doesn't have impacts on devolved matters. If, on the other hand, it, it starts doing some implement some of the implementation, some of which might affect um, devolved areas, some of which will affect devolved areas, then certainly um, you could make a case for um, the, the, the Legislative Consent Conce Convention to apply. At the moment, I think the position of the UK government is that Clause 9 does not require consent, but the position of the devolved governments is that it does require consent. And I would have thought that it, I would have thought the devolved government's position is correct because because these are implementation powers, which can be used in devolved areas. Is that a disagreement though about whether Clause Nine of the EU Withdrawal Bill yes. requires that yes. of consent? There's yes. a separate subsequent yes. question then in relation to this phrase that the, the the Withdrawal Agreement Bill would have to approve the final terms of the withdrawal. Surely then the contents of that withdrawal agreement, if they affect devolved competence in any way, that withdrawal agreement bill itself would also require legislative consent? Not, not necessarily, because we, we're up against our dualist system again. We, we, 
things that, that happen on the international plane are different from things that happen on the domestic plane. Now, this parliament has no competence in relation to things that happen purely on the international plane. It's only once things that happen on the international plane start having a domestic mm. effect that questions of, uh, of encroaching on the competence of this parliament arise. So that's what, why I say it would depend on what exactly that, um, that withdrawal or an implementation bill <coughs> does. I mean, we're, we're back to, I suppose, the kind of argument we had around about the notification of withdrawal bill, where the UK government says, well, this is simply about triggering an international process, and therefore it has no implications for, uh, for the devolved legislatures, whereas the devolved legislatures, you know, taking the logic of the, of the, the Miller case, say, well, no, the whole point is that we've collapsed that distinction between the, the, the international plane and the domestic plane. So, so we're, in, we're in a very <coughs> unclear and contested area. But I think if the withdrawal bill, I mean, if the withdrawal, the withdrawal and implementation bill were to do the logical thing, which is to take clause nine out of this, this bill and put it into the subsequent bill, so it clearly does have an impact on how the withdrawal agreement is going to be implemented in domestic law, then I think at that point there would be an argument for saying default consent is required. And that might be, as I, I suggested, that might be a reason for the UK government wanting to keep it in here because you know, the, the question of devolved consent to this bill is so much bigger um, and you know, it's easier to kind of uh, do a, de a deal when you've got a range yeah. of different considerations than when you're, you're just facing that one question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, I think. Okay. Uh, just, just to put it shortly, uh, a statute, a, a bill approving the withdrawal agreement, as Professor McHarg has said, by itself would not have any domestic legal consequences. Regardless of what's in the withdrawal agreement itself? Yes, uh, and as you rightly point out, or your question is premised on, yes, the withdrawal agreement will clearly have consequences, but the bill itself wouldn't have domestic legal consequences. Therefore, the question of this Parliament's consent would not arise. Unless, as Professor McCarr said, um, the the bill started to go beyond simply okay. approving the agreement and started to uh, legislate for you know what's going to happen okay. as a result of that. At which case, the, at which point, the question of domestic this Parliament's consent would, in all probability, arise. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. While we're on these wider issues, on Monday, the Council of the European Union agreed guidelines setting out the position of the EU with regard to possible transition arrangements for the UK's exit. Uh, the guidelines state the UK would be required to comply with all existing EU regulatory, budgetary, supervisory, judiciary and enforcement instruments. What impact, if any, would, these would such a transition period agreed along these lines have on the withdrawal? But I don't think any, but just for the record purposes, would that potentially have any impact on the withdrawal bill? Not on the withdrawal bill, but it, it would um, have a signif significant implications in, in terms of what's going to happen between uh, until 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 the point of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. it's a, if if that happens, then it's effectively extending EU membership, stripped of um, voting rights and all the rest of it, uh, until such time as. Um, but, if it, but if, if it extends EU membership, as you just well, I'm it, extends, using it extends the conditions, yeah, but yeah. not actual membership. The terms of membership. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, think, I think the difficulty is around about the definition of exit day. So everything in the withdrawal bill is tied to the concept of exit day. Um, EU law will cease to apply as of exit day. It will become retained EU law um, as of exit day. And exit day is defined on the face of the bill as the 29th of March, 2019. But that can be modified by regulations. So uh, that's what would need to be done. Some modification would need to be done in order to preserve the position in domestic law of EU law and to postpone the point at which we, 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 tr we transfer from the EU law regime to the retained EU law regime. But that could be done by regulations. So then the date of 29th of March 2019, if there is this transition period, 
may have to be amended to go to the end of that two-year period so that the withdrawal bill didn't actually come into effect until the end of transition. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes, so the, so the, the, the withdrawal way. bill doesn't come into effect until such times as we cease to be bound by the treaties would be, um, would be what's required. Alan? You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I sense there's a sort of Neverland quality about <laughs> this legislation when you talk about or, or the EU withdrawal bill uh, and set it against, let's assume, um, that this transition period involves no effective change in the terms of mem membership, then none of this is actually going to happen, depending on you know, what is actually agreed in terms of that transition until that later date, be it, um, what are they talking about, December, two years down the line, or you know, it would be 2021, December 2020 or the, um, March 2021. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. When, yeah. Is a, when is a withdrawal not a withdrawal? <laughs> Okay. Ivan, did you have any questions? I really sh can't remember. No, I don't. No, you don't. Oh, I think it takes away a lot of the, you know, this, this legislation has been presented about and has been talked very much in terms of the scale of the task, the urgency of the task, uh, and the need to get on with it quickly uh, if uh, we're talking about a transition stroke implementation period in these in those terms, and I'm not saying that is what will happen, but if we are, then that slightly alters uh, um, the, the time frame in which we're talking about getting domestic, the domestic statute book into shape to, cons to cope with um, the consequences of withdrawal. It becomes a, a less, it doesn't become any less, well, it might become less major or significant a task, but it certainly becomes less urgent a task. Okay, Adam. Thank you, Convener. This isn't a question of strict constitutional law, but, it, but you're both experts in the politics of the Constitution as well as in the law, strictly speaking, of the Constitution. So I, I wonder if you would w want to reflect on this, and you might not want to. Um, uh, and it's speculative because it's about the future. What do you think will happen, and what do you think constitutionally should happen if this Parliament does not give its consent to the withdrawal bill before the last amending stage in the House of Lords? Part of that's easy to answer. Part of it's difficult to answer. I think the what should happen bit is, um, is easy to answer. The uh, bill should not be enacted in its current form, I think is, is the answer to that. Um, if it's not enacted with, cons <coughs> if it doesn't gain the consent of the devolved legislatures, then it shouldn't be enacted in its current form. Now, what will happen um, and what the consequences of that would be, I think, are much harder to, to answer. What will happen, I mean, as far as I can see, the UK government does seem to be committed to gaining the agreement of, of the devolved governments. So that's a positive thing. Um, if it doesn't, I don't know what it will do. I, I, I wouldn't like to speculate on that. I think the... I'm reluctant to get into the what should. Uh, I mean, it's easy to say um, that the bill should not be enacted in its current form. I don't think that is going to happen, which slightly colours my view of the, the what should. Um, I think um, the UK Parliament would have no choice but to go ahead. Um, regardless of the consequences, it wouldn't. It would do it in terms of we are doing this with a heavy heart. We have strained every sinew, uh, made every effort to get an agreement. Uh, unfortunately, it did not prove possible to get agreement, uh, and therefore, with the greatest reluctance, we go ahead, uh, assuming, of course, they've got the majority for doing that. Um, and the question then becomes one of, um, as has been said, and I think rightly, uh, the only court that really matters in this is the court of public opinion, how, how that actually plays out in the court of public opinion. Uh, but I think there's noise surrounding it and so much 
else going on. You know, I'm not sure it would be take on quite the dimensions of a constitutional crisis that people, the language that people so easily use. Um, you know, there's a long way to go until we get to that stage. Uh, yeah, no, it, it is it is speculative, and it and it is also something which both governments are committed to not yeah. happening. I mean, exactly. both, both governments want this legislation yeah. to be passed yeah. with this place's consent. Mm -hmm and not despite the absence of this place's consent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is, you know, it's a very speculative question. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that we have an extra long parliamentary session. So we've got two years rather than one year <coughs> in order to get this bill enacted. So, you know, so if, if, if getting to consent takes a long time, well, there is, there is time to, there is time to do it. Although, of course, the longer the, the enactment of the, the withdrawal bill is, is delayed, then the, the, the more problematic that becomes in terms of reducing time for um, exercise of the regulation making powers. But as Alan says, if, if, we're, if we're going to enter into a, a two year uh, implementation transition period, then that uh, reduces some of those time pressures. Thank you. So you, what you're saying is this bill could be passed and in that transition period, another statute brought forward or, 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 or another instrument of some sort to try and get that consent? Um, no. Because what I don't understand in that, that case, Professor McCarg, is why we've got that time. What I'm saying is, is this bill, normally you have uh, the UK, in the UK Parliament, a bill has to be passed within one parliamentary session, which is normally 12 months or thereabouts. But the current session has been extended over two years. So that gives two years in which to enact the bill rather than one year. So, so what I'm saying is that the time pressures um, which would normally uh, apply to saying, well, we've got to move through the stages, we've got to move through the common stages, the Lord stages, get to royal assent. Um, these are less intense for this bill than uh, normally would be the case. And therefore, there is more time for negotiation between the UK and devolved governments over amendments to the bill. I mean, that would mean, del sorry, that would mean delaying the Lord stage in that case. It would mean delaying something or delaying ping pong <coughs> or, you know, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Adam, cutting across you. No, not at all. So there's, there's more time in terms of Westminster parliamentary mm. process, mm. but there's less time in the sense that the Article 50 clock is ticking and the 29th mm. of March date is there. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Although, as a, but if we are but then into a transition yeah. period, we've got longer could to do the, the transition. So it, that becomes less, less yeah. important. Going back to the, the Deputy Convener's question, one of the things that one would hope would happen in this period before we get to um, a constitutional crisis is that the area of disagreement will become clearer. Uh, at the moment, there is, certainly from the point of view of an outsider, there's an absolute lack of clarity as to, well, we know there was a GMC um, meeting back in October. Principles were agreed. Uh, we're told that progress has been good and all the rest of it, but we, we know no, no more than that. And uh, I think uh, clarity around that will go some considerable way to resolving the differences between questions for our next witness that might produce some clarity yeah, around yeah. that. <laughs> but is, is the disagreement between the UK government and the devolved administrations, is it within the UK government, which is a possibility one simply doesn't know, or I don't know. Neil. Um, <coughs> it was just related to that. Um, uh, Professor Page, when you were last at the committee, I think you talked about the possibility of standstill agreements to to um, to try and get you know legislative consent, and particularly around the issues of clausal and fra common frameworks. Do you still think that's a possible solution? Well, I was disappointed to read that the committee was not persuaded <laughs> by the merits of <laughs> any of the alternatives that had been put forward. But you know, I, I, I remain of the view uh, that there has to be uh, ample scope for um, you know, all the parties concerned. And I wasn't just talking about the devolved administrations. I was also talking about the UK government saying separately from the question of legislative consent, if you like. This is another dimension to, 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 to my previous answer. We won't do anything um, to compromise or threaten the integrity of the UK market or whatever uh, until such time as we actually bottomed out the, the disagreements between 
ourselves reached agreement on what common frameworks are necessary, how these are to be put in place, managed, changed, and, and all the rest of it. And that, that, in a sense, is a it's a key issue, of course, but it could be almost addressed separately from the bill, in the sense that you could strip out, in my view, Clause 11 uh, and continue uh, that process until you eventually reach the agreement. And going back to what we said earlier, there is a commitment, as I understand it, on both sides to reach agreement on those questions. So I don't see that the fate of this bill should hinge or depend solely on that question. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions at issue, but uh, I would have thought um, a self-denying ordinance whereby you say, you know, we're not going to do anything uh, until we work this out. We're not going to exercise our powers until this is worked out. I still think it's... Um, from my point of view, at least, uh, a possible way forward. Uh, I'm not sure that is possible in all areas. I mean, I, I can see that that would work in somewhere like in relation to something like environmental regulation, where you agree to maintain existing regulations until such times as you agree on what needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. But, but in relation to say agricultural subsidies, where a new regime has to be put in place, then there isn't the option of not acting. Something, something has to be done before but exit day or before uh, the end of the transition period. But you're going to have to do that anyway. You know, reach a, an agreement on what's going to happen in relation to agriculture and, crucially, who's going to pay for it, um, which is a whole separate issue which the, the legislation doesn't talk about at all. It's just about yeah. powers. It's not about money. Yeah, there is, there is a growing concern that we might have a pyrrhic victory over Clause 11, but it doesn't really matter because we need to get the cash anyway. Yeah. So we just need to, the next fight will be about the money. So. Yeah. Any other questions, folks? Well, thank you very much for coming along, uh, both, both professors, for that rather short session this morning, but very important session as part of part our procedures are concerned. I'm very grateful for your attendance this morning. Uh, and I now sus uh, suspend the meeting until I change your witnesses. Thank you very much.
Um, colleagues, we will now take evidence on the EU withdrawal bill as amended by the House of Commons. Uh, we are joined for this session by the Minister for UK Negotiations in Scotland's place in Europe, Michael Russell. Mr Russell is accompanied by Scottish Government officials, Ian Davidson, who is the Deputy Director of the Constitution and UK Relations Division, and Luke McBrackney, who is the Constitutional Policy Team. You're not, you're not the whole team, you're, you're part of it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I welcome our witnesses to the meeting. I understand, Mr Russell, you don't wish to make a s statement, therefore we'll go straight to questions. Um, Minister, the House of Lords Constitution Committee published its report on the bill earlier this week. I know that you met with peers also earlier this week, alongside your counterpart from the Welsh Government, Mark Drakeford. I just wonder, can you provide us an update on what was discussed whether you're an indication of potential amendments that might potentially be made in the Lords, and in general terms, give us an update about where you think we are in terms of the consent process. Yes, um, I, uh, Mark Draper and I uh, had a very uh, a constructive briefing in the House of Lords on Monday evening, uh, chaired by Baroness Finlay, a Welsh peer, and Samir jones Parry uh, also took part, as did Jim Wallace. And uh, we had a standing room only event, I have to say, about 40 peers attended. Um, there was detailed questioning on the issues that we raised, devolution issues. Say we had a broadly sympathetic audience. I say broadly because I don't think I could characterize the position of Michael Forsyth as being sympathetic on these issues. But uh, most of the others were pretty positive about things. Um, I think. I was very heartened to read the Hansard of the first day uh, of the two-day um, uh, second reading debate in the House of Lords, and the first day was yesterday, the second day is today. Uh, Andrew Adonis uh, brought forward a reasoned amendment, and uh, he made a very powerful speech at the beginning. He was at the briefing on, on Monday, uh, and he made the point that uh, no uh, second reading debate in the history of the House of Lords had ever had 193 peers wishing to speak. Uh, and I was very struck by the number of peers who wanted to mention the devolution issues yesterday. Uh, it was very, very interesting indeed. Lord Hope's uh, speech, the leader of the crossbenchers, uh, was, I think, one of the most powerful speeches I've ever read uh, from any of, house, uh, any of the Houses of Parliament. I commend it to people. I think it's a very clear and strong statement of why uh, this bill needs to change and the issues, the devolution issues within the bill. Um, I was interested that uh, Ian Lang commended uh, Michael for, uh, Lord Hope's speech in his contribution. Um, there were other contributions that also indicated who would be bringing amendments. Um, uh, Lord Hope has indicated that he intends to bring amendments uh, in the terms of the amendments that we put down uh, in the Commons, uh, well, well, we devised in the Commons between the Welsh and the Scottish governments. Uh, Lord Fowkes indicated, along with uh, Lord Wigley, that they intended also to bring amendments which would raise the issue of legislative consent and the relationship of legislative consent to the progress and passage of the bill. Uh, so we, I think the issue is well being well addressed in the House of Lords. The uh, committee stage of the bill uh, is due to take place over a period of time lasting up until Easter. Uh, and then, of course, there's a report stage to take place during April. Um, that is the positive part of it. I have to say the negative part of it is that we do not have an amendment or amendments uh, in any uh, concrete terms from the UK government. Um, and I heard Professor Alan Page, uh, in giving evidence to you earlier, uh, indicate that he, was, uh, he wasn't entirely clear about the nature of the disagreement between and the failure to agree between the UK government and the involved administrations. I think I can be very clear about it indeed today. And indeed, John Swinney and I are meeting David Liddington and the Secretary of State tomorrow, and we will be very clear about it tomorrow. There is no agreed amendment. There is no amendment that has been brought to us for the process of agreement. And we will and cannot agree uh, any amendment that does not, uh, that does not rest upon uh, essentially the uh, equity of treatment of the four nations and the way in which they will voluntarily enter into agreements on what should be the subject of frameworks and how those frameworks should operate. That's very simple, and we've been saying the same thing since the bill was published, um, and we've had oh, almost seven months of this. Uh, you know, the UK government is a government. It has to come to the table with a proposal. Uh, either that or to say it is not going to come to the table with a proposal. We can't go on forever having meetings about meetings. So uh, that is where the disagreement lies. There has to be an amendment to which we can agree 
which uh, it takes away the power grab of Clause 11. Now, there are other issues in the bill that require to be uh, uh, resolved. We've made that clear. But the heart of it is the inability of the UK government to bring to the table what they said they would bring to the table. Uh, and that's where the problem lies. Further on Clause 11, Ivan, I don't know if you've got any further questions on that. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Thanks for coming along. It, it, no, it sounds fairly clear in terms of what you're saying, as in it's not clear. Um, the, um, the amendments in the law, is, you've indicated that those would be along the lines of what the devolved administrations were looking for. So that, that does sound positive, um, but clearly that would then have to go back to the Commons and at some stage the UK government would have to engage in that process. Is that how it would play out? I know what the amendments in the Lords will be. I mm. mean, you know, the, the situation we are in, and, and I think we have a you know, fairly clear timeline of how this has moved forward. The situation we are in is that um, we, the bill was published last, the bill was published in, uh, on the 30th of July. We were shown it on the 30th of June. Um, the, in the 19th of September last year, we published our joint amendments, the first time that has ever been done between the two administrations. Um, the committee stage uh, started in, in the first amending stage started on the 14th of November. The First Minister met the Prime Minister and discussed the withdrawal bill. Um, I made clear to this committee on the 29th of November, once again, that there couldn't be a legislative consent motion without uh, an amendment. Uh, the amendment we put forward was voted down on the 4th of December. Um, on the 5th of December, the Secretary of State for Scotland said that Clause 11 will be amended in the House of Commons. Uh, the 12th of December, the JMC EN, Damien Green, made the same commitment. The committee staged end on the 20th of December. The report stage, uh, again, there was an amendment which was acceptable to uh, the Scottish and Welsh governments proposed by Labour. It was voted down. And the committee stage has now started in the Lords. We do not have that amendment. We have no amendment draft or otherwise from the UK government. Now, those are simply facts. So there is no agreement. Uh, there can be no agreement. There will be no legislative consent motion unless that changes. Thank you. Just beyond the, the Clause 11 issue and the other areas where uh, the Scottish Government said it was concerned about the bill. But can you give us a picture of what that looks like by way of discussions around the other elements that go Well, there was, a, there was a very minor change to the <coughs> bill at report stage, which uh, softened the issue of the ability of the UK ministers to change law in Scotland uh, uh, um, under delegated powers. We, there are still amendments required. We outlined to this committee, I outlined to this committee at the very beginning, four areas where amendment is required, the most important of which was Clause 11. There remain other areas. Those are areas which the Lords are addressing, and each of those areas will be subject to, I believe, the same amendments as the Scottish and Welsh governments put forward. Um, you know, everybody is saying, this committee is saying, that this bill needs to be changed. The Welsh Assembly voted unanimously including its UKIP members, uh, with regard to the continuity bill and the need for progress on this. So we need to see the amending process, but at the heart of that amending process is Clause 11. Adam. Thank you, um, Convener. It's a bit depressing that we're still here, um, uh, going around in circles, so it seems. But underneath the top level, my understanding is that there are um, uh, significantly intensified negotiations, conversations, discussions going on, particularly at official level, Minister, between your officials um, and UK government, minister, uh, UK government officials, Cabinet Office and Scotland Office. Is that correct? Yes, and, and I, you know, I pay tribute to the officials doing this. I also pay tribute to uh, Tory MSPs like Adam Tompkins, you know, who've been very positive about this need for change. I mean, there has been a, you know, a unanimity about this. But at the end of the day, there is a need for a political decision on this matter. There is a need for, you know, ministers are sitting down tomorrow um, afternoon you know, in this building, uh, and I understand David Liddington will have been in Cardiff earlier in the day with the Secretary of State for Wales. The need for the politicians to be able to say to each other, they need to say, here is our draft amendment, and we need to say, that works, that works, that doesn't work, and we need to have that conversation. Now, we can't simply rely on yet another intensification by officials because we haven't got to that. Uh, it is, I think it is really significant that the last time that the JMC plenary met was a year ago yesterday. So despite the, the view that there should be the closest of consultations and the, you know, the clearest of discussions about this, 12 months 
without a JMC plenary. You know, and there's a failure in political process here, and it's the political process that needs now to engage, uh, and it hasn't done so. I mean, and, and you know, to be fair, you know, the, the, the Welsh Tory AMs, the Scottish Conservative MSPs know that as well as I know that. But for some reason, there's a government in paralysis, and it has to change. Now, those of you who follow, uh, I'm sure you all follow in this committee very closely, the negotiations between the UK and the EU will recognize this syndrome. You know, the story about, you know, um, Theresa May saying, Angela Merkel, you know, make me an offer. They are the government. They have to come forward to the table. They have to have something to put on the table. And we're seeing exactly the same in these negotiations as it appears to be the case with the EU. So in, in terms of the intensified negotiations and discussions that have been going on at official level, and it's very welcome that David Lettington is coming here uh, tomorrow, and I hope those talks are successful. Um, one of the issues that you know we've debated in in the chamber, Minister, um, uh, is the need, and you you mentioned it a few minutes ago, the need for common frameworks where they are binding to bind UK ministers and devolved ministers equally, and that was one of the recommendations I think that this committee made in its report on the LCM. Uh, is that one of the stumbling blocks at the moment? Well, yes, I mean that, that 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 is a key issue. The key issue is the word agreement. You know, ca these framework cannot be imposed sure. either, either in subject or in content. You know, that's the issue. There has to be an agreement. Where, where, the, where it's likely that frameworks will be necessary. It, it, yes, I, I mean, I don't think there's much dispute about that. And actually, you know, the parallel discussions on what frameworks are needed, what are called the deep dives. I mean, I know some people objected to that term, but you know, the deep dives on the detail uh, actually could produce uh, and can produce results. I, I have no doubt about that. Uh, it, but they are contingent upon ensuring <coughs> an agreement, content uh, and, and, and function. And, you know, that agreement has to be the agreement between equals. That agreement not only has to respect the devolution settlement, it has to understand that there is an equity in powers. You know, and until that happens, there is no possibility of agreement. Uh, I, I understand that... Um, a, I know it's much quoted that a senior Tory uh, minister in London had said at one of these meetings that we may be partners, but we're not equals. If that is the prevailing view on these issues, there will not be agreement. Okay, thank you. Ash? Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the IGR. I know we're kind of covering some of the same ground, but on a previous appearance in front of the committee, you'd said that you felt that the JMC EN had been reset to a degree, and at least that it was meeting um, regularly. And then obviously progress was made when a set of principles was agreed, you know, for going forward. Do you think that momentum is still going now or has it stalled? No, it's stalled, um, without a doubt. And I think the reason you're being, and I'm very straight about this, is that unfortunately Damien Green's departure stalled the process. He had a commitment and had developed a commitment uh, to making the JMC work if he could. Uh, he had significantly slimmed down the attendance of the JMC, which was a big issue. You know, DMC had a cast of thousands, um, and it wasn't conducive to discussion. We were beginning to focus on the, bi the big issues, which include, it's not simply that it was 11. You know, there's a very big issue in terms of representation and involvement in negotiations. You know, the, 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 the terms of reference of JMC EN were twofold when it was established as a result of the Downing Street Plenary uh, JMC in October 2016. And, and the terms of reference, uh, there are four key points. They have to discuss each other's requirements of the future relationship with the EU. Well, I, you know, we put t papers in, they've been denounced, and then they turn out to be the same as the UK papers, which is, uh, I think, rather galling, to say the least. We were meant to seek to agree a UK approach to and objectives for Article 50 negotiations. It never happened. We never saw the Article 50 letter. It was never discussed. To provide, and this is key, to provide oversight of negotiations with the EU to ensure as far as possible that outcomes agreed by all four governments are secured from these negotiations. That is the involvement issue. It didn't happen at all in the first stage. <coughs> it now has to happen in the second stage because areas of devolved competence are being dealt with in those negotiations. And it says discuss issues stemming from any negotiation process which may impact upon or have consequences for the UK government, Scottish government, the Welsh government, the Northern Ireland executive. Um, no. So, you know, this terms, these terms of reference have not been observed. Now, we met, last met on the 12th of December, meant to be a meeting before the end of January. It hasn't taken place. There have been endless negotiations about meeting dates. Uh, the UK government is, tends to be insist upon Tuesdays and Thursdays, even for first ministers, you know, ignoring 
First Minister's questions and questions in the Welsh Assembly. Uh, I think we may now have a date for the JMC EN towards the end of February, uh, and I think work is still going on a date for JMCP. What priority is being given to this? And how will this, these terms of reference, agreed amongst all of us, these aren't imposed, these were agreed amongst all of us, how will they operate? And we have no proposals on the issues of involvement negotiation, though it was a key issue at the JMC EN on the 12th, and we were told that they would be coming forward with proposals to ensure that this happened. Nothing. You can understand an element of frustration in this. We can, <coughs> we can indeed. So on a slightly different note, um, you said that you'd listened to the session we had earlier with the two professors who were giving us evidence. Professor Page said that, in his view, we were a long way from a constitutional crisis. Do you share that view? Um, no, uh, and I reluctantly disagree with Professor Page, but I don't. I, I said on Monday, I think we've been in a constitutional crisis for some considerable time. I think it's simply deepening as day follows day. Um, and it is deepening because of the United Kingdom government and its failure to observe the JMC process, its failure to bring forward an amendment, and its failure to recognise the importance of this. Thank you. Alexander. <coughs> um, if I could just talk about uh, common frameworks and some of the progress and some of the detail. Now, Nova Ministers always want to avoid conflict, but you know, where adjudication uh, you know, is needed. You know, for many people, the logical uh, final court of adjudication, uh, given other parts of the UK legal system, would be the Supreme Court. Um, would you agree with this? And, and if not, what would you, or what are you proposing uh, instead? Um, I, I sort of started out on this journey thinking that there would need to be some sort of Supreme Court of adjudication, not the Supreme Court, but some. Actually, I've been quite impressed by some of the mechanisms that already exist to resolve issues. If you look at the fishing issue, you know, there are in actual fact some fairly complex and long-standing arrangements between governments in terms of discussing issues of contention within fisheries. So actually, I think one of the discovery processes during the, the deep dives in these areas where frameworks have been agreed to be uh, useful or desirable has been that there are many mechanisms that are already in existence. Of course, in areas like fisheries and agriculture, there will also be primary legislation from Westminster. So where there would require to be you know, a, a, a governance system established in statute, then the potential exists for that statute to be passed in any case. So I think it's unlikely that we would want to construct a system that was very legalistic in, in its operation if there were existing mechanisms that could be used, or if within the legislation going forward by agreement with legislative consent, there was a possibility of establishing that, um, uh, those, those systems. So I'm actually quite hopeful that we could make this quite fleet of foot and, and quite less bureaucratic than it would otherwise be and probably less legalistic. You know, we have narrowed this down quite substantially in terms of what will be involved. I had a positive discussion with the NFUS this morning about some of the agriculture issues. And I think we're quite clear that you could construct this in a way that was non-bureaucratic and that was quite helpful. And, of course, you know, the Council of Ministers operates in that way in Europe, that there can be consensus and agreement. And, you know, the, the idea that you would have the four ministers involved in, in agriculture meeting together and being able to agree these things on the basis of equality would be a positive thing. <coughs> I'm not sure how much Michael Gove would enjoy it, but um, the others might find it quite productive. Thank you. Adam? Can I ask a supplementary on that? Um, you said before, Minister, that animal welfare um, might be an area where you would expect there to be the need for a common framework. So let, let's take that as an example. Suppose there's a common framework in the area of animal welfare, um, and, uh, and you want to act uh, in a way which the United Kingdom government thinks, reasonably or unreasonably, rightly or wrongly, is contrary to that common framework. So there's a dispute between the two governments. Mm -hmm. You think that that dispute should be resolved without recourse to a court of law? Well, I would hope that we could make a structure that would allow that to happen. Okay. I'm not saying... Can you just talk me through the detail of well, what that I'm structure not, might look like? I'm not saying like. I can guarantee that. No, right? sure. But I'm saying that, for example, if we were to accept a common framework of regulation within that area, the regulatory framework would probably dictate how this would work in terms of the actions of each individual government. And we would understand the parameters for those actions. If a government wanted to act with that, uh, then there would be, of course, an issue. 
But I hope that the framework which we presently have, for example, on regulation, tends to operate without that happening most of the time. Uh, there, are, there are occasions, uh, and, and I'm just going to try and anticipate uh, this, there are occasions, of course, you could look at some of the BSE disputes you know, with France, where that becomes a matter for the Commission and the, the system in there. And therefore, I think that needs to be borne in mind as the regulations are being drawn up. Uh, and you then have the added complication that, of course, if you're going into regulatory alignment on a, an agricultural issue with Northern Ireland, which might be in regulatory alignment with, the, with Ireland and therefore the rest of the EU, you might well have a function there of, of the ECJ. So you have a complex thing. I need to understand what this is going to look like without having the courts at least as a backstop. Because, okay. look, I mean, you, you mentioned the Council of Ministers and how it's resolved in the Council of Ministers, but as you know and as you've just mm -hmm. said, you know, the Commission has the power under Article 226 yeah. of the treaty to take any member state... Uh, to the Court of Justice, directly to the Court of Justice, whenever the Commission thinks that the member state in question is infringing uh, EU law. I'm and not saying that there would not be and could not be such difficulties. Yeah. I am saying that we started off in these discussions um, on the basis of seeing what the existing frameworks could deliver, and we are heartened by how much they c could deliver in these circumstances. But look, I think the important thing here is when we get to the stage of, of being of visualizing the frameworks in detail, you know, uh, uh, presuming we get through this difficulty, then we need to sit down with this committee and discuss these issues in, in more detail and give examples of how they will and won't work and have those scrutinized. I'm sure what you say, and I'm quite heartened by it because previously Scottish ministers and indeed Welsh ministers have been very deeply critical of the dispute resolution procedures in the JMC, but now it seems that you want to, you know, no, you want to maintain I, some kind well, of JMC-style dispute resolution rather than, going to, rather than going to court. Well, I'm not sure that that's true because I think the corollary here is and one of your own recommendations in terms of a statutory footing for the JMC would actually change that structure and atmosphere. Um, and you know, we will respond to those. In fact, we will respond today to, to, to your recommendations uh, in writing. But I, I know the issue of having a statutory footing of the JMC might also encompass this, uh, and I'm not unsympathetic to discussing okay. that. Right. Thanks. Murdo? Thank you. Um, on this question of the common frameworks, I mean, of the 111 powers that, that uh, are in your list of, of proposed amendments originally, um, I think we understand a number of those would be subject to common frameworks, and there are a number of others which wouldn't require that, which could simply be devolved straight to um, uh, Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament. I mean, is there actually a list formulated anywhere of which falls into which category? Yes, um, we're, we're pretty well down the road of, of that, but we're not complete in my view. Um, you know, I, I know the Secretary of State for Scotland has, has talked about wanting to publish a list of where we are on this. I'm not against talking about that, but we've not finalised the deep dive process yet. There is deep dive on animal health, or is it plant health this week? Animal health this week. I think both, actually. Both. And, <laughs> yes, it's amazing what you have to keep abreast of. And there is, there is one on procurement on Monday, I think. Right? So until that process is complete... And until we have bottomed out, to carry on the deep dive um, analogy, uh, exactly which of those you know, is involved, I wouldn't want to, to release anything from the list. But broadly, the list you know, was obviously able to be subdivided into those things which actually there was no need for anything. I mean, Adam Tompkins wrote about that. I think it was aircraft noise you used as the example in your Scotsman piece. I'm a, an assiduous student of, of Mr... <coughs> Tomkin's writings, uh, you know, there were things like that which you could put to one side and say that should never, actually, nobody should be bothered with that. Things in the middle, some of those were already subject to frameworks of one sort or another, uh, and therefore there's not much point in worrying about them because they're there and they operate. And then there were these additional things which needed to be looked at. Now, you know, remember our starting point, middle point and end point in this is that all of those things were and should be devolved, right? So what we're talking about is consent and agreement, not just consent, but agreement amongst us all that there was this much smaller list that would be subject to frameworks provided we could agree that they should be and provided we, should agree, we could agree on the form and content of a framework. And it's that smaller list that we're in the process of, of, of finishing work on. Okay, thank you for that. If the Secretary of State wants to publish the list as to where we are at the moment, is there any particular reason why you don't I think it's that? premature, because we haven't finished that work. 
I mean, I can't imagine why we would want to do that until the work is done and we are able to say with confidence those are the areas. But the other thing is that none of those will happen unless we get the agreement on the bill. You know, I mean, the, the reality is that it's a bit of a distraction in my view. I'm happy to talk about it. I commend the work that's been done by officials. It's been detailed and thorough. But, you know, it, it, it is not an end in itself. You know, if, if David Liddington and the Secretary of State arrive tomorrow with a, an amendment in their hands which we can negotiate, then progress is possible. If not, it isn't. Yeah. On the common frameworks, um, if, whether it's an implementation or a transition period, um, and if, the, if that period is entered into, um, as the EU laid out at the beginning of the week, there isn't that same urgency around common frameworks anyway. No, I, I, I was interested in Professor McHarg's um, analysis of timescales on this and the previous evidence she gave to you. Uh, and, of course, there's a middle element which needs to be considered, which is the time that will be taken for, for secondary legislation, you know, which will have to be undertaken during this period. So it's not elastic. You know, there, are, there are parameters on both ends. You have a wider bit at Westminster, but the transition period, yes. And, of course, the transition period... The, the present uh, intention for it to last until the end of 2020 is in itself you know, a debatable point. I mean, quite clearly, I'm not, you know, my view is it should be destination and not transition. But even those who believe in transition, or, or as the Prime Minister calls it, implementation, uh, do believe, many believe, that you need a longer period. Okay, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Just looking ahead at the possibility that agreement isn't reached. Uh, between the two governments on the EU withdrawal bill. Uh, you've indicated the possibility of a continuity bill being introduced here. Uh, your letter to the Scottish Parliament's presiding officer on the 10th of January uh, said, to that end, our officials are developing a continuity bill for Scotland. Uh, this letter is intended to give you and your officials notice of the likely introduction of this bill in February and its submission to you for pre-introduction scrutiny later this month. That presumably means later in January. We're now at the 31st of January. Can, t can you say where things stand with that? And more particularly, what is involved in a continuity bill and what would the job of scrutiny look like in, in this parliament of, okay. of that substantial piece of legislation? It is with the presiding officer. Uh, and therefore we await the presiding officer's view. I'm not at liberty to publish the bill uh, until the presiding officer has, has given his view. Uh, the, uh, and therefore, you know, I'm not at liberty to go through the detail of the bill at the present moment, but at the earliest possible opportunity when we introduce it, this committee clearly will be uh, uh, very keen to see it. Um, the bill essentially seeks to achieve what the withdrawal bill does, that is, is to ensure there is no legislative cliff edge. Um, and presuming if it is approved by the presiding officer and seen to be legislatively competent, uh, then you, the, the Parliament will judge uh, how it should uh, how it should be go forward. Um, it, it will be a bill that requires to go through more rapidly than other bills, uh, because quite clearly it has to be through before royal assent is given to uh, the EU withdrawal bill, because it does the same job and it has to go in uh, essentially at the same time. We have a longer period between passage and royal assent, uh, as you will know. Uh, and therefore, the time scale will have to be constrained. But that will be a matter for the Parliamentary Bureau and the Parliament to discuss. All we can indicate is what the objectives would be. Um, but I would want to see it having the maximum scrutiny. Uh, you have seen the EU withdrawal bill. Uh, you, you know, so therefore, the, 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 the means by which this might be done are not unfamiliar to you. But I can't go into any more detail than that. When you say you would want to see the bill given maximum scrutiny... Um, and notwithstanding the fact that the decision on procedure would be for the Parliament to make, the government will make its proposal for what that procedure should be. Uh, can I assume that you would not be seeking uh, to have that bill pushed through in a single day, but that you would want to extend some greater scrutiny for that, both in this committee and in the Parliament chamber? Uh, I would, I would want to see the maximum possible scrutiny of that bill. Uh, you know, I... I, I would hope that we would be able to achieve that within the time scale I've indicated, but I'm not in a position to say what the government will bring to the Bureau as yet. You know, we very much are thinking about this, thinking about what needs to be done. Um, I don't want this bill to be 
you know, anything other than subject to the, the widest view. But equally, there is a time scale in there that will have to be observed. So I, I'm, I, uh, that discussion has to take place. I think it's just worth reflecting on the fact that emergency bill procedures tend to be used for relatively yeah. minor or technical yeah. matters, not for major constitutional change. It is not a, a bill like, I'm trying to remember an emergency bill, well, the one that, re did, uh, that was involved in resetting tolls on the Erskine Bridge under the, the, the Labour and Liberal administration. Yeah, it's not of that nature, of course, and we accept that. Thank you. Um, you said um, earlier early on uh, this morning, Minister, that the UK government gave the Scottish Government the courtesy of um, uh, sight of the withdrawal bill two weeks before it was published. Will you return the compliment by giving the UK uh, yeah, Government I, sight of I the continuity bill two, two weeks will, before it's published? Yeah. If I know, when I know it is to be published, of course, that will be the case. Um, well, I, and I don't know. Uh, you know. I'll be very clear. I have no publication date in my mind at the present moment. But the moment we have, uh, I certainly think two weeks is the minimum I would want to give. Willie? Minister, could you tell us where we are, if anywhere, on the Charter of Fundamental Rights? Have they gone, and are we now relying on the Lords to perhaps bring them or elements of them back? Well, there is absolutely no doubt. I think that the Lords will wish to do that. I mean, I was aware of that in, in discussion um, on, um, on Monday. You know, it, is a, it is a key concern, and indeed one of the areas that uh, uh, what, uh, was raised with me by Lord Fawkes was whether or not the government had a view on other issues in the, uh, the withdrawal bill over and above the devolution issues. And the answer is yes, it does. But the, the common work with Wales has been designed to focus on the devolution issues. But of course, uh, we don't believe that the, the, that the rights will be adequately protected by any of the proposals that the UK government has yet made. Um, therefore, we will have to make sure they are addressed. We would want to make sure they are addressed. And of course, addressing them in the Lords would be an obvious way forward. Uh, and, you know, and we would hope and expect that the Lords would do so. Well, do you expect them to try and bring the whole Charter back in on block, or do you think there'll be some kind of picking and choosing to try to get some uh, kind of agreement? A number of the peers that I've spoken to are very keen to restore the status quo on this and are not convinced by the UK government's arguments. I mean, that is a matter for, for, for the House of Lords. Uh, and despite my uh, discussions with them this week, I'm not an expert in House of Lords procedure. I mean, it's up to them what they do, really. But I know there's a keenness on that. And, you know, there's a very strong view in the House of Commons remains that they, the proposals that they went through are not adequate. Okay, Emma. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm interested in exploring the report that was published this week. It's an online report by BuzzFeed. And it, it was an EU exit analysis cross-Whitehall briefing that was published. And it stated that leaving the EU will adversely affect um, almost every s sector in the UK region. And they quoted that almost every sector in the economy included in the analysis would be negatively impacted. Chemicals, clothing, manufacturing, food and drink, cars and retail. So I'm curious about what the reaction has been from the Secretary of State, David Mundell, regarding this or any other analysis. And uh, has there been any comment from the Scotland office? I, I'm unaware. So I'm, I mean, I don't spend my time trawling the Twitter feed of the Scot Scotland office, but I'm unaware of any, any such uh, comment. However, I, I think you could, um, you could note with... Uh, perhaps a wry interest, the Secretary of State's comments on the 17th of January, when he described the Scottish Government's reports, which actually comes to virtually the same conclusion. You know, that Scotland's place in, in Europe, uh, as published in, uh, on the 15th of January, uh, you know, was, at, I, 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 in fact, when I first saw the first coverage of the BuzzFeed coverage, I thought they were talking about our document, uh, you know, essentially it's, it's made the same point. And the Secretary of State of Scotland said, um, objective observers might wonder if the aim is to provide bracingly frank analysis or to try and talk up the challenges of Brexit. Uh, you know, the reality of the situation is that I, I think that report, insofar as we know it from the BuzzFeed um, uh, leak, and it should clearly be published, it was meant to be shown to cabinet ministers only in locked rooms. But if that is published and does do what I believe it does, which is confirm our own views, then there is a question of whether the Secretary of State for Scotland had seen the UK report at that stage or knew of its existence. And why, therefore, he would attack a report in exactly the same terms from the Scottish Government, um, but fail to mention anything about his own report. Do you think that, that that kind of report might be partly what's contributing to the paralysis of the UK Government that you describe? Andrew Adonis, uh, 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 in his opening speech in the House of Lords debate yesterday for the reasoned amendment, uh, quoted uh, um, 
George Orwell uh, in his essay, Politics in the English Language. And Orwell wrote that in times of crisis, and I quote from Adonis' speech, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful, to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. The political language we've heard around Brexit has, is in aiming to disguise the fact the UK government can't have a policy because if it moves on one side, it will offend one group. If it moves on the other side, it will offend another group. So this is all its vague generalities that we have heard for the last 18 months. But you can't come to an agreement on vague generalities. You have to have a specific agreement. And we saw that with the different interpretations of what took place in December, um, particularly over the Irish issue, and we are seeing it again now. And there will need to be a position taken. Now, I, you know, I, I know little of the internal machinations around the... Uh, the Clause 11, but it does strike me that a, an outside observer might think that's exactly what's taking place. There are some people who don't want that change to Clause 11, and there are some people who do want that change to Clause 11. And uh, in the middle are, are ministers who are endeavouring to balance the two forces. Some, what you learn in government eventually is that you've got to make a decision and you've got to push ahead with that decision. And if the UK government wants to bring the amendment, it should bring us the amendment for discussion, and we'll make progress in that way. Minister, just a final question. Obviously, we all hope that Clause 11 issues will be resolved. We hope that we can come to a successful conclusion in how we come to agreement on common frameworks and that all these matters can be put aside. But at the end of the day, this is going to come down to uh, the money. Um, because we, get all these, we can have these pirate victories around Clause 11, which is important. But if the cash isn't there, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this, this really matters. So where have we got to? in discussions about cash, if anywhere. But well, suppose suppose the, these discussions have not produced any results because, they, you know, the, again, the rhetoric is one of the problems. Um, Michael Gove, in his speech to the Oxford Farming Conference, for example, uh, made a, an assertion about continued farm support till uh, 2024. Uh, no such commitment has been made to Scotland, so we don't know whether that will apply or won't apply. In that speech, incidentally, he, he mentioned the archers more often than he mentioned the devolved administrations. So, you know, I don't think his focus is on the matter, things that really matter. But we need an indication of money and money flows and fiscal flows, and we just don't have those indications. Assertions are made, and then pressure is put on us, put on the Treasury by us to try and make sure there's a certain supply here. But it all folds into, you know, what I read out in terms of the, um, uh, the, the, the JMCEN uh, remit. With a functioning JMCEN and an atmosphere of mutual respect, you, know, you would ask me that question and I would be able to say those are the discussions that are taking place and that's what's happening. I can't because that's not what's happening. So you know, if David Liddington is a new broom and he has the opportunity to show it, he has to come here tomorrow with a cast iron commitment to get the JMCEN process up and running and working and he has to come determined to get an agreement on Clause 11 and the details around the bill. Uh, uh, and that includes in the JMC involvement in the negotiations and making sure that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government are, are in there. That's what we now need. And without that, then you know, we continue in this state of, of chaos or not wishing to contradict uh, Professor Page, constitutional crisis. OK, um, thank you, Minister. Thank you for your uh, official colleagues coming with you today as well and giving us evidence. Uh, and I'll close this session of the Finance Committee.